My guest today came well recommended from friends that you and I know that think highly of him and his work with the spirit world. Aspects of his early life were tough. Yet through the consistent love of his mother and his brother and sister, he managed to excel in particular interests, to be ranked Britain's number one at it. Today, he is a qualified medium and healer, enjoying his new life working with and for the spirit world. But the number one loves of his life are his beautiful wife and equally beautiful son. I can't wait to introduce this kind and gentle man to you now. Ladies and gentlemen, speaking to me from the Highlands of Scotland... Mr. Stephen Trolland, CSNUT. This is the Spirited Talk podcast. Conversations and much more about connecting with our friends and lost ones in the spirit world. And now, here's your host, Trevor. And a very good, warm welcome, although I should say it's pouring down with rain where I am, but a very good morning to my special guest, Stephen well, I've been looking forward to this because your friend of mine, Adam, said I should talk to you. I don't know why. <laughs> Maybe he sees something in me. I don't know. Um, he's a, a very dear friend to me and we really inspired each other along our journey. Yes, he's a, he's a lovely man. He's actually coming into this studio uh, a week on Saturday, I think, to do a particular recording with us. So I'm looking forward to seeing him again. So let's kick off with your story. Let's start off with the official stuff. Tell us your full name and your title and tell us at this moment where you're speaking to us from as well. Okay, I'm from the, the beautiful Highlands of Scotland. I've got my, my CSNU and speaking, demonstrating private readings and also for, for teaching. And I've also um, been an approved healer, all with the, the Spiritualist National Union. Very good, very good. But I'd like to hear your name. <laughs> Stephen Trollin. Stephen Trollin. <laughs> now, also, you know, you know I, I don't mind people being a little bit vague, but the Highlands of Scotland carries, covers a large area. Can you narrow it down? What's your nearest big town? Yeah, the nearest big town is Inverness. We're about 30 minutes south of Inverness, just right in the, in, in the middle of, of all the mountains. And there's a ski resort here as well. Oh, right. You're over that side. For some reason, I had it fixed in my mind. You were over the other side near um, Ben Nevis, that side. But you're not. Fort William. Aviemore. Aviemore is what? Near you? That's where I live. That's where I am. Do you know what? Look, I know this is your story, but sometimes I do like to butt in. Do you know, <laughs> in the 1970s, I was in what was called the TA, the Territorial Army. Da, da, da. They gave me a rifle and a gun. Can you believe it? Anyway, one of our camps was in a place called Comrie in Perthshire. And one of the days we had to go to Aviemore, um, yeah, Aviemore, to do some skiing. I thought it'd be great fun. It wasn't. It was horrible, to be honest. I kept falling <laughs> over. You had these great big shoes on your feet, but oh, but you go there all the time. But we'll find out why later on, won't we? Now then, yeah. where were you actually born? I was actually born in Inverness, 30 miles north from here. Been to Inverness when I was doing my courier work. Beautiful part of the country. And yeah. it's very, very quiet. And the good thing about Inverness, you know, in the journeys I used to make, which was up to, oh, I can't remember the name of the place now, on the north coast. But when I got to Inverness, I knew I only had about 100 miles to go up to the Navy base on the top, uh, Thurso. Oh, yeah. 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 So Inverness, and they had a Tesco's Express in Inverness, so it was quite welcoming. And just to <laughs> fill up with fuel there. Look at that. What a boring story. Anyway, thank you for coming today. Right. Let's get back. <laughs> Are you married? Have you a partner? And have you got any children? I've got a beautiful wife called Trisha and a beautiful son called Brody. Uh, he's just about, just over two and a half now. Ah. So it's just, a, just amazing. And you've said you've had to kick them out of the house today so as you could do the recording. <laughs> they, ki <laughs> they kindly offered just because, uh, well, Brody can shout and scream and make a noise and all his toys and a wooden floor downstairs. So, um, yeah, it's just so it's quiet for, for the recording. Now, you know, using my psychic abilities, I believe you were born in 1973. That's right, aye. When I say psychic abilities, it's probably research, but nonetheless, so <laughs> <laughs> I'm not that good. Uh, 1973. So what is that? What yeah. star sign are you? Uh, Sagittarius. And when you were born, do you have any uh, brothers and sisters? I've got a sister physically living and I've got a brother in the spirit world. And are you still talking? Obviously not to your brother, to your sister? Yeah, both. Uh, is there a story there for later? 
<laughs> yes. <there is>. <laughs> <laughs> and you were brought up by your mum? I was brought up in a family house. My mum and dad uh, separated, but I'm, I'm close to my mum, very close to my mum. Was your mum present in your upbringing or were you somewhere else? Oh, my mum's always been present. She's always been there for us. It's a beautiful lady. What was sort of a household were you in at that time? Was uh, money tight for your mum? I think for, for all of us, yes, it was and still is at times. <laughs> yeah, we got by though. Or was your mum a bit of a, a, a tough Scot? Was she very disciplined? Uh, no, she was the most uh, giving person that I know. She worked hard, like two or three different jobs all at once, just to try and help bring money in. Yeah, one was home help as well, looking after some folks. My mum was a home help. That's quite a hard job. My mum used to come come home and complain about the things she'd had to do, <laughs> which, you know, we, we won't mention here. She's well known in the past for having, like, I don't know, six or seven bags on her bike of shopping. Cause she used to do the shopping for them as well and cycle up the road. Yes. Uh, with no brakes sometimes. <laughs> yes. Oh, and that, that's so like my mum. My mum had a, had a bike. She had one of those small wheeled bikes. And you could see our mum going around the neighbourhood and she always had bags and things strapped yeah. to them. A funny story has come to mind on that. My mum, she used to have a way of getting the old people to give her things, not in a horrible. She would say to people, oh, I really like that vase you've got over there. Oh, that's a nice piece of jewellery you're wearing. Oh, that <laughs> really? And she would make a big deal of bringing it to their attention. And usually when they pegged out or sometime later, they say to mum would you like this and she go who me oh really you thought of me oh bless and she used to come home and, and i used to think yeah well you're an irish she was irish you you, <laughs> you calm that out of her really but hey there you go that's it you say home help does that mean that you know she was not at home some of the time yeah yeah um, quite a lot of the time um obviously we were at school as well but um, she would go to different people's houses and, and cook for them, clean their house, you know, people that weren't able to do those things for mm. themselves. Mm. And um, very often she did way over the hours that she was getting paid for just because she's, she's got a big heart and the, the people would phone her if they were in trouble or needed something done and she would just go out even in the evening sometimes, you know, when she wasn't supposed to be working, she'd go and help them. And how did you know that your mum was ever in a good mood or a bad mood? What, what were the signs for you? <laughs> it's hard to say because uh, my mum holds a lot in and she's very good at it and not really t saying her, her true feelings. But sometimes you, you just know, you know, and bring her a bunch of flowers or something now and again. Then more obvious, when did you know that she was happy? What was her little favourite thing that she would do when she was happy? Was it like a, a bubble bath? Uh, she was happy when she was around her kids and also her, her grandkids. She, she looks after our boy now and again. And my sister has three boys as well and she she just she wouldn't want to do anything else that's that's what she loves most well i know i've spoke to you off mic is uh, a lot and you have nothing but deep love and care for your mum which is a wonderful wonderful quality to have she must have been amazing absolutely was your mum into any religion and uh, no i found out later on in life that she used to do the ouija board and things like that as well so she's always been investigating it, the spiritual uh, movement in some way. You know, loads of books, you know, ah. a lot of Stokes and that. Was she Protestant? Just her. Just, just her. So there was no family religion that she no, was born or no, born into? No. Um, I'm just going to say Bank of Scotland there, then I meant to say <laughs> Church of Scotland. No, they just rob us. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> Holy oh, brilliant. Did did your mum ever, was there ever enough money that you could sort of, she could save up and send you away on a holiday? The first time I ever went abroad was way after I left school when I started moving into my snowboarding. So back at home there you are with your, your sister and at the time your brother, I presume he was around while you were in your sort of teens before that? Yeah. Yeah. So how what was a, an average Christmas like? What was what was a great thing when you knew it was Christmas? What was happening in your house? The excitement and uh, I've got asthma and nearly the whole night I kept getting asthma attacks because of the excitement and I could not sleep at all. 
And I remember me, my brother and my sister, when we were told that Santa was still alive, we would sit at the top of this, no, well, Santa's real, should I say. <laughs> we were sit at the top of the stairs and all, all of a sudden you'd hear the sellotape getting pulled out and we're all grabbing onto each other excited and trying to tiptoe back into, into the, uh, the bedroom. And we also searched the house to see if there was any present, presents hidden and what ones can we like what one's yours and so on. In your house, did your mum have a chair for you and a chair for each of the brothers and sisters? Uh, no, uh, we'd have a big stocking and we'd have a pile on the floor for a, for each person. And and did your mum spend a lot of time making the dinner? Was that a special meal? Absolutely. My, my brother loved it, especially. I got a funny story one time. She, she puts her heart and soul into it because it was special. And then uh, one time when she went to put the gravy granules in, you know, you save up all the juices and stuff from, from, from the cooking and mix them together into the gravy. And she ended up putting uh, <laughs> uh, curry granules into it instead by mistake, instead of, 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 of gravy granules. Oh, oh she, she was it's still a story that we remember. OK, let's have a look at that television. It's, it's Christmas afternoon and you're all there. Did you kids get to see what you wanted or was your mum watching Andy Campbell or whoever it was? <laughs> I think we got to just what just all oh, the members just all the Christmas programs on. I remember one in particular I think it's called A Beautiful Life it's a black and white one but I always remember in it that there was some some guy he kind of loses his life in some way and his, his, his connection to his to his family and uh, there's a, a, a saying in it when the bells ring the angel get their wings yeah uh, and at the end the bells start ringing and he's back with his family and so on that's, that's one particular I remember it's Jane's favourite film and we watch it every year uh, with um, oh. James Stewart and uh, oh, it's, it's, it's amazing even now I've watched it like 30 or 40 times and I still cry it's fantastic so okay Christmas is over we're getting back to normal life here now what were you doing in the day while at home up to the age of about 12 were you inside drawing and stuff or were you out playing and messing around mostly i'd be out playing and, and rolling down hills and getting dirty and ripping my, my my trousers and stuff just for like or wearing down the knees on my jeans just for sliding in the mud and so on obviously if it was, it was raining i would be in, indoors playing cowboys and indians or something like that monopoly <laughs> Even though we're not quite the same generation, I'm get, I'm getting a picture of it there. I'm I'm getting a feeling there were a few plastic soldiers around from the old. <laughs> That's and you used, right. you used yeah. to get about twenty so plastic soldiers in a bag for about a pound or whatever, and it was so yeah, brilliant. Yeah. And if you were lucky, you had one of those wagons in there where you you know push the wheels on and you. They don't go round, but, you know, you've got a little wagon for the Indians. Oh, yeah, brilliant. Yeah. Absolutely it, brilliant. Making go-karts as well. You were just talking about uh, wagons. But we used to make our own go-karts and tear a car, a pram, for example, but get the wheels on and just a little nail in the middle so you can steer it with your feet and a bit of rope. Yeah. Uh, go, go flying down the hills, uh, crash into the wall. <laughs> but how do you think that lady felt when she came out of the supermarket and found you'd nicked all four wheels off her pram? <laughs> Shh, don't tell her. She might be listening. <laughs> what about school? When you went to your very first day at school, were you one like me that cried when mum left you there? Absolutely. I, I remember uh, being so young as well. I remember the first day at school and remember my mum leaving me there. <laughs> Uh, don't feel bad mum if you're listening to this I still remember it <laughs> no but I remember it but we got into the school it was fine I kind of met my forever friends there you know I'm actually distracting him on camera because uh, three straight questions that he answered the third question was a real hard stinger and I'm teasing him with an object in my hand at the moment <laughs> so do apologise if he breaks out uh, into random <laughs> laughter mm. Very nice. Oh, that's, my... a, that's a lovely cup you got there. Yes, yeah, a big one. I should <laughs> I, I, I should be picking it up most of this interview. Just warning you. <laughs> Brilliant. So, school. Now then, you, you say you were into all the adventures. So, from a very early age, you did you have a bike? Were you bike riding? Yeah, I remember my, my first BMX. It was a silver one <laughs> called Zero. No, actually, before that, it was a striker that I tried to make into a BMX by getting lots of different, like all, all the pads that you would get for the handlebars and, and putting it together on, onto the striker. Oh, wow. Yeah, that, I mean, that was the name. That was like the chopper bike almost. That was... That's right, I And the grifter as well. My, my brother had a grifter. 
<laughs> Do you know when when I was a kid, my dad he worked at a hospital where there was a tip nearby, and he used to go browsing around the tip like you do to see what he could find. And he knew that I wanted a bike. I was so you know I was young, I was like eight yeah, or nine, yeah. and I said, Dad, can you get find me a bike? Anyway, one day he came home and he was excited. He said, Hey, lad, come out here. I've got you a bike. And I went, Wow. And we walked outside, and there was a bike. It must have came out of the nineteen thirties, and it didn't <laughs> it didn't have pneumatic tires. It had solid tires. <laughs> It was horrible. It was horrible to ride. It was a bit bumpy. Oh, it was it was terrible. But he, he took me around a place called the Lanet in Gloucester, um, which is a big sort of playing area. And I remember him pushing me, you know, from behind and letting go of me while I learned to ride a bike on that stupid bike. So yeah. And they were they were important parts of our childhood, I I must admit. But you had already I mean, here you are, ten, twelve, thirteen or so, you're already fine. Finding the great outdoors is, is a massive adventure. Absolutely. Um, same as our, our wee boy, he just loves the outdoors. It's just that we live in such a beautiful area, you know, with all the woods and the hills. He used to just venture up into the mountains and so on. Yeah. Up to the waterfalls and go camping at the waterfalls. Yeah. Do you know what? There's a lot of people that will think Scotland's quite small. Well, l- let me just tell you from a courier's perspective what it's like. From here to the borders of Scotland, um, to Dumfries and Galloway, um, is it a couple of hours away? Now, when you get to Dumfries and Galloway, you think, oh, Scotland, I'll be through this in 10 minutes. Well, you then got, I think it's about 80 miles to Glasgow, the capital. And then from Glasgow to Inverness, I think it's roughly about two or 300 miles. From Glasgow? to embrace a rough guess about 150 or something like 160. Well you you're above or below Aberdeen? Uh, We're to if you're looking up the map up towards Scotland we're um, left of Aberdeen right in the middle. Well the point of me saying this is because I used to go to a place as I said called Thurso which is right up on the very very north now I remember this is absolutely true this is only within say 10 years I went to Thurso I left Thurso at something like eight o'clock in the morning on this particular journey and I traveled all the way back down to Inverness before I seen a car that's how quiet it is in Scotland. It's nice. It's not like that at the moment, obviously, with the, the tragedy we've had with the virus and that people not going away abroad. So so quite a lot of people are, are coming up here and discovering how beautiful this place is. Oh, yeah, it is. It's incredible. And, you know, I, I said to Jane the other day, because, you know, they've got this TV show on at the moment where these celebrities are touring um, Scotland. And I said to her, I'd love to go to Scotland, but it's always wet when I go there, so I'm not. <laughs> well, what's the weather like where you are just now? Uh, what's your point? <laughs> what, what should we? <laughs> All right, let's move on. Uh, okay, did you did your mum? You know, did she pack your sandwiches or did you have a school meal? Uh, we had money, to money get a pound that we could spend at the tuck shop. But I was always so hungry. At break time, I would spend all my money on food. And then by the time it came to lunchtime, I had 10p left. I was like, will I get a 10p mixture or will I put it in this car game and, and have a shot in, in this car game? And it was always that choice. <laughs> yeah, Tim, Tim, what is it with parents that think they can give you money? Like I used to get thrums to go to Sunday school to give into the collection. And I realised that you could get 12 penny blacks for a thrums. And I never went to Sunday school. I just, you know, went and bought sweets. What is it with the parents that think they can trust us at the age of, <laughs> <laughs> well, any, anything under 25, to be honest? But. <laughs> What was your favourite sandwich, though? Come on, I, I just, I, you know me, I like my trivia. My mum always makes amazing ham, lettuce and tomato sandwiches uh, with a little bit of salad cream, a little bit of pepper on it as well. It's nice. My wife, I don't, wife, my partner, I don't know what's wrong with her. When I say, can I have a lettuce sandwich? She goes, what? You don't put lettuce in bread? Oh, yes, you do. It's the nicest sandwich out. So, oh, I like your mum. What was your mum's signature dish when you used to come home? You used to think, oh, wow. Oh, a treat would be curry. Oh, really? Yeah, used to make a great curry. Hence probably why she got mixed up putting the, the curry granules into the, the, the Christmas dinner by mistake. <laughs> and and you had no, no problem with the spices? Oh, I love spicy food. Well, it's because of your mum. That's why. So another silly little question for you. Up until about the age of 13, what is your favourite toy that you can remember? I think the go-kart that we made. My friend um, Alan Baxter um, made this go-kart and and we would just go to the top of the hills and just bomb down. Obviously, it would fall apart a bit now and again, you know, but it's all part of the adventure. Yeah. 
anything outdoors you know my dad made us a go-kart and he made it out of like half inch ply and uh it was great it had opening doors it had a bonnet on it we had pedals but it was so heavy that we hardly ever played in it it was just oh you know it must <laughs> must have weighed about 200 pounds so how would you describe yourself now looking back as a child what would you think your temperament was were you a goodie or baddie i've always been in some way soft easily hurt but without trying not to make it show. And I've always had the question in some ways, like, who am I? In some ways, well, even even as a child, um, I always remember looking up at the stars and thinking, God, I wonder how the stars got here. I wonder what, how, if, whatever made the stars, I wonder what that, how that got there. I was always trying in some way to fit in or trying to be somebody because there's this part of me wondering, who am I? And um, I think it got me into a lot of trouble um, at times as well. And going into my, my teenage years, into my, tw- into my 20s as well, kind of going down the wrong paths. I've never shared this in any spiritual network at all since I've started this. Uh, and I used to uh, take um, uh, drugs as well. But it's because then I used to get nicknames because of, of maybe the amount that I took of cannabis that was. And um, I used to get nicknames for it. But at that time, it used to make me feel, well, maybe this is who I am. I know that you had a favourite book. It was almost like a book. I know that you had, you know, uh, an issue we're going to cover in a moment. But yeah. you had a particular book that you loved. Maybe it's because of the pictures or I don't know. But can you tell us about that book? Alec Harris. It was written by his wife as well about his physical mediumship. Uh, it's just an, an, the thing is, it's, it's easy to read. And I think that's what what made it good for me as well. And I think with the the interest of it, I just found it fascinating. And then you think all that in just that little book. Can you imagine how much more within his physical mediumship with his, his wonderful wife that supported him as well? that isn't in that book and for the listener i think we need to go back to the era when it was i mean we're talking 70s and 80s and for me even younger than that and there was still mystique about these people that appeared on tv and about the things that they did there wasn't the masses of media that there is nowadays everybody's Mm. a superstar these days because they can make themselves a superstar on social media but there was this mystique behind people mediums in particular you thought wow they had to be born Born gifted or oh they're special um and you found yeah. that yeah yeah that's, that's what i feel as well when did the bullying start at school oh in the secondary school uh, the prefects the people that kind of were supposed to look after everybody take look, have control of this in, within the bus um on the way home and the way up there um i used to yeah get pulled up to the back and kind of got picked on a little bit as well yeah, and, and also there's other other uh, people as well that kind of uh, not knowing how how soft I was at the time, how much it would hurt me just by just a simple word would just kind of make me feel depleted in some way, you know. Again, I, I've said before in interviews I was bullied as well, and I found a way out was to make everybody laugh or you know be the joker be the practical yeah, idiot that's exactly what i did yeah, yeah. uh it, but, but it only works it's very fickle it doesn't really work very much on that added to this issue were you diagnosed dyslexic or did that come later that came later i've, I've not had the diagnosis of it but um, i've always had a, um in high school i'd be taken out the class and getting taken to a place called special unit and where they would just ask you to write and do certain things you know but then at the time, I think because it was constant in the writing, he found the spelling was okay now and again. And, and that's, that's all that happened in, in the school. It's got uh, taken out now and again. But it's not until later on is when, because there was always books I wanted to read and I find, try to read it. I, after I read it, I didn't know what it said. I'm just reading the words. And if I said it out loud, you would hear the words, but it has no meaning to me. It's just kind of come more to the forefront or more knowledgeable over time and I think maybe that's why I found school quite difficult as Mm. well there was only one exam that I passed in school woodwork uh, metalwork because it was practical 
I could just think of how to do it and have knowledge of and go and do it rather than having to put it down on paper and work it out on paper. Hmm. Um, so practical things, maybe that's why I'm more an outdoor person. Do you blame the education system for not uh, highlighting you and being able to help with that? Or do you just say it is what it is? I think it is what it, what it is. Um, I mean, you can't turn time back in any way. And it looks like they were investigating it in some way as well. But it just come to its whole fruition until after I left is when I found certain things more difficult with it. And it's not just uh, reading and writing or finding the right words to say. Sometimes even like although they've got the knowledge in me, uh, like speaking to someone, I know the word, a simple word of what I want to say, but it's just not coming as well. And, and people's names, dates and things like that, even now, um, I, I still don't know. It sounds terrible. As much as I love my mum, I still don't know of, of her birth date as well, and even my sister. So everyone kind of reminds me now and again and writes on a calendar for me. So thank God for the calendars we got just now that we have on our phones that I can check every day. <laughs> yeah, and I'm just thinking, Jane, if you hear this, this is why I don't remember your birthday and our anniversaries and even Christmas. You know, you need to remind me of these things. <laughs> <laughs> it's Christmas. <laughs> hey, well, that's got me out of that one. Thank goodness for that. For that. The Spirited Talk podcast has evolved, and now, more than ever, it's about educating determined students like you. If you're keen to improve your connections with the spirit world for personal unfoldment and development, you're looking in a good place. The Spirited Talk Foundation. The small fee you paid for this episode will go towards the ongoing costs of the project. Here's something interesting. If you'd like to save money, check out the options to become an All Access Partner. As a partner, you'll have unlimited access to all of the content in the Foundation Library. Thank you for supporting us. My name is Stephen Tron. I am a psychic and a medium. I love listening to Spirited Talk. It is so inspiring and enriching listening to other people's insight they have to share from their life journeys and communion with the spirit world. Hi, my name is Marlene Walgar from Hassocks in West Sussex. I'm a medium, teacher and healer and I love listening to the Spirited Talk podcast because I find it fascinating to get an insight to other mediums and spiritual workers' lives. I find them really inspiring. Hello, it's Adam Berry, spiritualist medium from Berry, Lancashire, and I love listening to Spirited Talk. There's some wonderful guests on and some interesting stories. I highly recommend. Hi, my name is Daniela from Enschede aus Holland. And I'm a spiritualist medium and auch a spiritualist healing medium. I hear lefthaftige Sprache in my bed before I sleep. And welcome back to the second half of this story. I am looking at Stephen. He's loving this experience, but he knows at this very moment we come to that point where we've got to deal with Arthur's questions. Now, Arthur's got 10 questions and you're only going to be expected to answer one of those questions hidden behind one of the numbers. But you have to promise solemnly to answer the question honestly. Stephen, you look like an honest Scot. Is there such a thing? <laughs> yes. Yes, yes. <laughs> <laughs> right, so are you ready for the question? Yep. What's your number? Number seven. Here is your chosen question. Question seven. If you inherited one million pounds, what's the first selfish goodie you would buy? Oh, gee. Um, I think a, a nice big camper van that enables you to have more freedom within your life. Go anywhere, do anything, whenever it pleases. That's what I would say. Nice one. I like that. <laughs> I like that. Already, we know that camper van's ahead of the wife. <laughs> <laughs> Don't tell her that. <laughs> I'm only joking. <laughs> she wants one as well. <laughs> yeah, I'm kidding. I'm kidding. When I when I when this question came up originally, Jane said to me when I, when she heard me recording it, 
She said, so So, what would your answer be? I said, well, I'd obviously buy a house in Lanzarote. You know, it's where we go all the time. We love it. And she said, oh, that'd be nice. I'd like that. And I said, I didn't say you were coming. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I'd put you in the good books there. <laughs> <laughs> right, brilliant. Let's get back to your story. OK, listen, as a teenager up to the age of 13, we're still looking here. What was your music? What music were you into? Rock and roll, like Shaking Stevens was one of my favourites. This Old House, what's it called? This Old House is Getting Shaky. Uh, I'm not going to sing it. Uh, another wow. one was Green, Green Door. And there was, a, there was a Christmas one as well. That I like Snow is Falling. That's one of the, some of the words in it. But I'm certainly not going to sing it. Oh, well, uh, that's actually a condition. You have to sing it. And there's people going, no. oh, yeah, this old house. <laughs> no, OK, fair enough. We'll, we'll not put you through that. Did you have a favourite uncle? And I'm, I've got in brackets Tom. I've not got a, a favourite uncle. So I like them all just the same. And I haven't got an uncle Tom. We'll cut that bit out. <laughs> <laughs> oh, dear. Did you have grandparents? Or grandparent? Yeah, I've got my, my granda on my mum's side. He's in the spirit world now. But my gran is 95 years old now, and she's in a, in a care home at the moment. And it was just recently, well, she broke her hip. She had to go in for a, an operation at the Rigmore in Inverness, the hospital, to re replace a part of her hip. And she took a bad reaction to the uh, anaesthetic. And then we got told she wouldn't last the night. We don't think it will last the night. So my mum and my uncles uh, went up there and then sat with her because they were, she was in one room and not in a ward. They were allowed the three of them because of the, the virus and so on. Uh, my mum said she didn't recognise her own mum. But by morning time, a nurse came in and she was surprised of how much she started to look stronger. And then two days later, she's sitting up drinking a cup of tea. So, so she recovered quite amazingly. We got a call the other night saying her, her breathing had been affected kind of thing and they thought they were going to lose it again. Mm. Um, but she just keeps going. She's, she's just an incredible lady. And what was her name? Jeannie Anderson. Oh, well, that's lovely. <laughs> I've written here uh, cinema, swimming, eating out. Did you do any of those? No, the, the first time I really properly ate out in a, in a restaurant um, was when I started my, my competing days in snowboarding and that was that was in France uh, first time I did that properly cinema that's funny funny stories there as well I used to um wait till when the kiosk closed after they took in the money and given out the the tickets then I, I would go and sneak in and I remember sitting there one of the times that comes to mind is Lost Boys and it was the the vampire one and I was sitting in stitches by myself uh, people probably turning around one <laughs> look at him laughing at himself, you know. Did your mother ever sort of treat you and you had a Chinese or an Indian? Yeah, we got um we've had takeaways, yeah. And that was all, always get curry as well. My mum still loves curry for, for from the Chinese. Uh what Chinese curry I think I think's the nicest myself. Yeah, uh, it used to be uh chicken, uh but now just uh, I like uh, the vegetable one. We're going up into your teenage years now. You're becoming a bit of a uh more of a handful than you were. Were you the sort that went to and I've listed it here as did you go to a nightclub or a working club or pubs or none? Oh, I used to go to the nightclubs but couldn't really go until I was actually 18 and even then I had to take my birth certificate with me and a photo of myself for some kind of ID because I looked so young. Um, I was the smallest person in my class at school, you see. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, wow. So <laughs> it gives me a timeline. Here you are. You're in the nightclub now and the disco is playing and your favourite record is being played in the background. What is it? There's one called Children, um, it's called, and it's kind of, there's a, a techno uh, one to it. Robert Miles. Uh, is that what it is? It goes, ding, ding, ding. That's the one. Yeah, that's the one. Uh, I like that one. Oh, so I know where you are in your era now. Wow. Yes, Robert Miles' Children was a big hit, in, in certainly in the UK. And it was so different because you thought he was playing a piano and it was a bit more techno than that. So, OK, come on. And let, I'm looking at you now. When did you fancy your first bird? <laughs> um, that was in primary school. Um, and that was a, a lassie called Daniela Kalayo in the early years as well. I'm um, God, I'm... Put myself out here now. Uh, when we became a, an item, when we were still in primary school, <laughs> uh, I went and knitted her a purse 
because uh, I used to watch my mum knit and I used to try and knit as well. Um, and, and I knitted her a purse. Do you know what? I You had me in that story until you said you knitted her a purse. <laughs> <laughs> no. <laughs> maybe, you can, maybe you can cut that bit out. Yeah. Eh? No, 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 I'll leave it in. But I, I, you, you lost me. There. I thought, all oh, right, okay, fair enough. Okay, what about in your teens? Did you see anybody you fancied? Yes, but there was a part of me that felt, am I good enough? You know, there was always this part of me because I always used to see my friends um, getting girlfriends and, and going off with different girls or whatever. And I, I just wanted a girlfriend that, to, to be loved and to love. And it didn't really happen that much. And that's when I was just kind of, I, I guess, searching for myself in some way. I, I wasn't searching myself for my, for myself. I just wasn't able to pull, honestly. Nobody, nobody wanted a ginger-haired, big-eared, lanky person. Got a funny story there too. Um, um, I mean, uh, people talk about chat up lines and so on. I don't know how to do that. And uh, the first time, well, when I was meeting my beautiful wife, was at the Arthur Finney College, what you know of. And um, she was in my class all the time. And I was just hoping to be maybe paired up with her so I could speak to her and so on. And I even tried to talk to her in the bar. It's like, how's your week kind of thing? And she's like, oh, it's good. And then that'd be it, nothing else. And of course, I, I don't know. I, I'm I'm quite shy, you know. Uh, that's where the conversation really ended. And then in the in the hall in the morning after dinner time, everyone's getting their taxis and so on. Um, I said this in my speech at my wedding as well. Actually, everyone was waiting for the taxis, and I was just about to go and get mine. I thought, okay, I'm just going to go and speak to her. I don't have a clue what I'm going to say. Don't know any chat lines. My heart was pumping. I got up to her <laughs> and says, um, "Are you on Facebook?" And that was my chat up line. Are you on Facebook? But it was the best chat line I've ever ever done because here we are now. That's amazing. I I, I can totally go with you there. Pulling, as we used to call it, was um, that was where I failed most in life. I think. Me it? too. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and you used to get the lads at school that would come in and say, mm, you know, and they would brag what they'd done the night before, and you think, wow, wow, I, I didn't get that. I didn't understand it. I was, yeah, I don't know. I'm, I'm looking at you whether you were the same. I was kind of immature for a long time in my early years. Yeah, I would say I was. Again, probably trying to get attention, trying to be somebody. Yeah. There were certain things, uh, certainly in the early days, there were certain things that were talked about a lot at school, and I didn't know what they were. I mean, in our days, excuse my listeners here, put your hands over your ears here, but the children used to walk around the playground saying, yeah, you've got VD. <laughs> I did not know what VD was. I, I th- no, no. And I thought I must have it. I still don't. <laughs> <laughs> and then, and then um, the other one was, of course, I didn't know what it was. You know, when someone calls you a name, you automatically think, no, no, I'm not. So people would come up to me and say, are you a virgin? And I would say, no, I'm not. <laughs> and they call me out there. Been there with you. I was in my 20s before I lost that, that particular thing. So, yeah, I'm absolutely with you. Now then, you were um, very much... Oh, actually, before I move on, I, I'm just excited about this. I really like finding little snippets from the time frame. So let, we're, we're talking up to the age of 18. So from 0 to 18, what's the first major media event you can remember being in the news? Oh, that I can remember being in the news... I don't know. I don't think I can think of anything because I didn't really watch the news or take in the news at all. I thought the news, thought the news was boring. <laughs> oh yeah, well it still is. Still is. <laughs> yeah. So there wasn't an event when you came in the house and your mother had the telly on and she'd say shh shh shh. Sh. There wasn't an event in particular you remember. Not that I can remember, but, but there was one time that so I can't remember it. I get told about it that we had so much snow here. It was called the big storm. We had so much snow one year. Um, where the, the helicopter had to come around to drop food bags and things to the people uh, outside their houses because uh, the, the, it'd be way over the cars, um, even the height of snow plows as well uh, in different places. That That's one event that I can think of uh, around those times. Well, on the same theme then, uh, again, between zero and, say, 18 years old, what do you think was your favourite television programme? What did you really like to watch? Probably Tom and Jerry <laughs> or The Roadrunner, even at that age. Me, me. <laughs> I loved it. I, 
<laughs> loved it. Yeah. Are we from are we are we from reality in some way, you know? Oh, the Roadrunner. There now you're getting me thinking there. Oh, absolutely brilliant. Love that. Oh hi. Yeah. Now that you've already said you were very much an outdoor person. And when when you left school, what did you leave with any qualifications? I just left with a happy feeling thinking it's over. <laughs> I didn't really like school, so I was happy when it finished. I didn't get you know, pass any exams, really, um, apart from the technical one. What was your first job that paid you some money? So that might go back into your school years. i got a feeling it might have with you. Tell us about that. It was at a, a fish and chip shop uh, in Aviemore called Max Fish and Chips, I think it was. And I had a little restaurant attached to it, and I got a job as a kitchen porter there. That was uh, um, a pound an hour. That sounds like absolute <laughs> heaven for me. <laughs> did you get did you get any takeaways at the end of the night? Did you get what was left? Yeah, you can get 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 what you wanted, yeah, at the end of the night. Did you yeah. sort of accidentally get some cooked ahead as soon as you knew there was something to take home? Yeah, yeah, we just <laughs> got what, what we wanted really. Oh. Um I've always, I've also, if I worked in a chip shop, there would be about six battered burgers left at the end of the night. I go, oh, I'll take those home. So. <laughs> oh, heaven. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm easily pleased, as you will find out. So you, you got this job, and you said it was a pound an hour. How many hours a week were you working? Oh, sometimes I'd, one, one week I worked about 50 hours or something like that. That, that was the most I worked. Usually a guess in mind about 20, 20 something hours, roughly yeah. 30 hours. And I'm seeing you as a kind of a generous, loving home person here. How much of that dosh did you give to your mum? My mum, um, she she didn't want anything, even though sometimes money uh, was difficult. But uh, later on in life, um, she did take something, maybe just like a five or a, a week or something like that. Yeah. She, she couldn't, because of the dyslexia, I suppose, she didn't really, your mum wasn't able to, suggest education being a good thing for you she you had to it is it, it was what it was yeah it was was what it was and that was it i didn't even know what dyslexia was back then or anything did you have any ideas what you would love to do when you leave school no i just it was what it was it is what it is that that's where i was within myself and i didn't have any places like to work where i wanted to work or anything like that bit boring really <laughs> no 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 it, well yeah if you say it's boring it is I, I don't think it is i think this is very exciting because we're gonna really put a spark in the in the midst right now you know, this is your time to excel this is your time to tell the listener what you achieved within your athletic career I achieved six podiums and two british titles at snowboarding for britain uh, traveled all over europe uh, as well uh, first took off in a car an old banger an old ford fiesta that i bought for 300 pounds that was rattling and i didn't even know how to read a map and i took off to drive to to france to to have make my base there as well so with hardly any money <laughs> by the way i like the word you said britain there i, I do like the word britain but <laughs> <laughs> and, and Scottish jams too. <laughs> uh, anyway, so you've gone across that very quickly here. So, what? Where were you ranked in snowboarding in the UK? Yeah, number one. You were number one snowboarder. Yeah. There was a couple of different point series as well, uh, which we had to follow, not knowing which one uh, to follow. One was ISF, and I was ranked number one on that uh, for a long time. Wow. Um, don't you ever let me hear you hear you telling me how little you've achieved in your life. You are truly remarkable. That is brilliant. Well done. Thank you. And snowboarding, did this come across? Did you did you start this by accident? Did you fall down a hill and that was it? <laughs> <laughs> how did no, that... the ski resort just from here where I live is just nine, ten miles up the road. And so I was able to get uh, free tickets there as well. Uh, and sometimes we didn't buy any ticket at all. We just jump on lift because nobody checked. And um, I was skiing for a while because I, I learned to ski in school. Um, with our school, we'd go uh, once every two weeks, I think it was. That's when the weather was all right. Um, so I learned to ski there. But when I went onto the snowboard, I didn't really know what to do, how to do it or anything. I, I just did it. So it was something that was quite natural to me and then from there moving onwards from it, I thought 
you know, it's just it's a place where I felt so free in the moment. All the worries that I, I, I'd ever have in my life just disappeared within the exhilaration of being in that precise moment, allowing my board to, to take me wherever uh, I felt. It wasn't until later on is when I started doing my um, British Snow Sports Association, BASI, it's called, doing my qualifications. That, that's what it is. And I kind of looked into it in more detail there of figuring out, okay, what am I doing to make the board go the way it was? You see, so, so I started to look into it more and more detail and uh, refining it a little bit more. And then um, the Scottish champs came. I uh, never entered a, a competition in my life. Uh, the Scottish champs came to, to the Cairngorms as a ski resort up the road. And um, I thought I would just enter, you know. And on my first run, because it came in two runs, first run I came uh, second. Uh, second run on the giant slalom, which where my passion was, I went too hard um, and, and uh, blew out. Basically, the pressure that built up on the board made me ping off the course. And then, but there was the board across, which is where you get six people going down the hill at the same time over jumps and over bumps and so on. And I came second on that also. And then for the rest of the season, um, there was competitions that happened, like memorial events, instructor races and so on. I won every single one um, of them for the rest of the season. You were talking at a time where this sport was breaking through in the UK. You were kind of one of the founders. If yeah, there was a, another main founder here, a lady called Leslie McKenna, and she was already out in, in Europe and competing and so on and, and doing really well at it. And I think she was a, a great inspiration to me. Uh, also, my friend, Alan Baxter, he actually won a bronze medal at the Olympics one time for, in the slalom. And he was a great inspiration to me as well. I could go on with the, the people that has been incredible inspiration. And, and I'll just mention one guy called David Smith. I'll to cut a long story short, he's been such an incredible inspiration to so many people uh, with the amount of um, spinal, in, uh, spinal um, tumours that he had. And going over it really quickly, what he had to do mentally, emotionally, physically to learn to even walk again is absolutely incredible. But he went through this about two or three times and then he won a gold medal at the Olympics for rowing after doing all this. And he had lots of knowledge behind um, his like qualifications, behind like the, the development of of exercises to do and so on so I'd be copying my friend Alan Baxter and Dave Smith who would give me like a personal trainer give me ideas in some ways to train because I used to train over train six days a week uh, sometimes seven and the, one of my easy days would be running up the Cairn Gorms with the ankle weights on um, and that's from 2,000 feet to nearly 4,000 feet um, that would have been an easy day. And um, I, I know you were talking to me before the interview started. I think it was yesterday. You were talking to me about something which I'd like to pick up on now, which I think is absolutely brilliant. You you said that at the time when you were at your best, the board was part of you. There was no disconnect between you and the board. The board was almost like it was living with you. And then absolutely. suddenly you then started to... Uh, examine your technique have a yeah. look at it in detail yeah. and that ruined it that broke that connection tell me the whole thing as you explained it yesterday i thought it was amazing okay it's involving uh, mediumship a little bit as well and when i was sitting one time because we look at mediumship as a muscle and again it's like you look at uh, people that work at it all the time as athletes in their own way it's when um, i was sitting one day and I was contemplating, like, trying to figure out if I do it this way, if I do it that way. But I felt the inspiration come from my own soul, trying to work out mediumship in my mind to start with. And then I had the feeling within me saying that where it's natural and the way I felt it was, it's like when I was going down the hill in my snowboard, the first few runs in the morning um, were my strongest because my muscles were strong then. And I didn't even have to think really to go a certain way or just be like, it would come from the intention and my board would just go. I was at so much at one with the board. But, but later on, when the muscles started getting tired, that's when technique had to come into play to keep me going. And then if we look at mediumship, 
in that way as well. I say to, to be as free as you can, let it be as natural as possible. When you start to feel yourself maybe coming out of the power, uh, your own thoughts get in the way. And then you can take your focus to something, say like to a technique. And one uh, I mentioned yesterday to Trevor was to, if, where do you feel uh, nervous um, when you feel nervous? It's in the abdomen, the stomach area. And that's where all the sensitivity is with the living thought. Because where you put your attention, you give your power. And with the living thought, just take your attention to the abdomen there. And by that, it will help stimulate all that sensitivity at the same time, creating focus and bring you back into the power, into the presence of who is there communicating, for example. That's how I felt it. So my snowboarding has had a massive part to play with him unfoldment and development, understanding it. When you said that line yesterday, as you know, I wrote it down immediately because I thought it was the most amazing quote. After 20 years of doing this, you put it in a language that I could understand. And it was, and you just said it, whatever you give your attention to, you give it the power. Absolutely. And I thought that was, that it was an incredible line. And I thank you for that. That could mean anything in life really as well. So why be involved in negativity when you can put your focus onto something beautiful, like maybe the person that you are inside, and that will bring um, each individual um, back on their path of, of happiness. Okay, so let's go back on this, the snowboarding career. Approximately how many years did that span for you? Rough guess, probably about six years, seven years. Yeah, of traveling around Europe, firstly in my Ford Fiesta and eventually got a camper van. But money was so tight at times. I was so lucky that my home village managed to come together, even without me asking at times, to create fundraising events for me to be able to get to the competitions. And uh, sometimes it wasn't always the competitions where I could gain the best points, which is really what was needed. It's more like the ones where I could afford to get to as well. I remember one year my, my car was broken down and it was in the garage. The garage was about to close uh, in two days and I had no money to get my, uh, my car out the garage. One of my sponsors um, it didn't come through and then eventually I managed to sell my boards uh, to get money to get my car out the garage so I could get home. There's lo lots of stories like that. At the time you were snowboarding, were you married? No. The, the, the competing days, I wasn't married. I was still snowboarding. You say you were number one. So let's define that. Number one in Scotland? Uh, in, <laughs> in the UK. Oh, the UK, yeah. <laughs> yeah. I know you're having a little job. By the way, while that was recording, my partner, Jane, came into here to bring a new cup of tea. It's a plain red cup this time not one with a union flag all over it so <laughs> poor old Stephen can relax on that one so yeah you were UK number one yeah how about in Europe in the Europe standings I did manage to do a one Europa cup and after that I think it was like 30th or something like that roughly wow in, in Europe and that, that was after one European cup for the European standings it's like the the day before that race it was just the title of the race because there was two races that day because in, in each race there's FIS European Cup and then there's World Cup so the first day was FIS it was just the, the the amount of points that were available in that race but I managed to come ninth which was which was a good result but with the same people in the, in the, in the same course at the European Cup was the next day where I didn't um, do as well as ninth. So you, you can imagine if I managed to get that ninth place on that European Cup day, I, I would have um, been quite high up in, in Europe there. And as we've already learned from you, Stephen, there's this, I suppose, this fallacy that people have that athletes like yourself, uh, are, you know, are going to be super rich from the sport. You know, there's loads of money and everything. And that's not the case, is it? No, I actually ended up going bankrupt. And I know other other athletes did the same as well. Way back last year, uh, maybe the year before, you you if you've listened to it, you'll know I've interviewed Rachel Casson, uh, who was um, British. Oh water, yeah, water yeah, ski in, the, champion. in the water skiing. Yeah. yeah, and you know when I first you know spoke to her, I thought. You know, she was going to be some kind of megastar. She was going to be, you know, super rich sportswoman and this, that and everything. Yeah. And when she talked me through the process of becoming just an ordinary person that used to float around on the water in her own town in the Midlands to be becoming an athlete, doing going for the World Championships, yeah. there was 
this transition it wasn't through stars and lights and and bang and it, it was it was just plain take part in competitions you had to get there you had to uh, fund it and this and the other it, it, i'm quite amazed that you athletes have devoted so much of your life in a sense to achieving something which we all basically share in and you really don't get many rewards other than that at least I've, in some way i've got something to tell my wee boy as well Something right. to leave him. Uh, you haven't mentioned that wee boy's name yet. Uh, Brody. Oh, yes, you Brody. did. Brody. Yeah. Oh, and I'm digressing a little bit here, but I've been watching a, watching a Netflix series for, well, we finished it now. It was called Homeland. Oh, okay. And, and I would recommend it to everybody. It's basically, Homeland is the uh, CIA in, in America. And this is about these guys, these people that are really deep undercover working for the US in Afghanistan and this, that, and the other. But there was a character in there that we all were hooked on that we all loved his name was Brody we kind of liked this guy but we kind of disliked him as well because he was one of those they, they wrote him both ways but yeah yeah they didn't know if he was a spy or not yeah well they, they even killed him off at one point and we seen him die and then about three episodes later he wasn't dead it was all a, a big cover-up sort of thing anyway no, I, I'm digressing from the point there so during the career when it was starting to not come to an end but you, you, was there a point where you started to worry about what you were going to do thereafter not really there wasn't that worry I, my soul was say moving me towards the path that i'm on now but i mean the competing part is supposed to be the hardest part but the politic and everything that's involved was the hardest part as well and, and the finances was the hardest part as well and how certain governing bodies weren't really doing their jobs right as well and, and actually they they went into liquidation themselves just before one of the olympics which proved that it was badly run so there was lots of stuff that kind of really held i'd say most of the athletes back from achieving their true potential including myself when did you marry that beautiful lady that was in 2016 oh you're a newlywed really <laughs> yeah and why did you decide i gotta do this kind of got roped into it in a way no i'm only joking <laughs> it's just something that we just <laughs> decided you know it just felt right and it was one of the most incredible days that, that we've had you, you'll know of a, a an incredible lady called eileen davies that um works at the college and yes. so on as well um we're, we're very privileged that she came through a spiritual blessing uh in, in the service and we had to write a, a spiritual promise to each other. And it was quite deep. And it was like from one soul to another, really. Mm. And, it, and it was quite enriching. There was a piper there as well. And he says he was nearly drawn to tears because some of the words that were said, it was, it was quite beautiful. Mm. Uh, but we didn't know which one each other person. But, but, but like my wife didn't know what I was writing. I didn't know what she was writing. And it's quite amazing how we both wrote similar things as well mm. towards each other. It's a very special day. Yeah, we are kind of jumping ahead in the story there a little bit. There's a few clues been given <laughs> out. But I'm looking at my clock here. I think we've got the first episode wrapped up uh, for that. I'm going to leave uh, with one final question to close this first episode. When did you first experience a death in the family? That was um, when, obviously a lot younger, I can't remember the age, but it was my, my great-grandmother. She, she passed away. Uh, that was my first one that, that I know of. And, and that was that was a big hole in our hearts. And yeah, I was gonna, that's the next question, as you know. How did you comprehend that? What did you think was happening? At the time, I, I didn't know. I'd, I'd go into the nursing home where she was, and I didn't even know why, really. she. I just thought she just needed help. That was all. I didn't know that she was actually going to pass away kind of thing. Yeah, she, she was such a, she is, she just say not was, but is. Such an incredible lady again. I'd imagine she's got, got, I wish I could have a proper conversation with her physically, the stories that she could tell through her, through her life, living through the wars and so on. But I think um, I always, always remember um, mostly her budgie. Uh, her name was Jeannie as well. And every um, certain night she would go to the, say to the budgie, Jeannie's going to bingo. And then the, the, from then on, the budgies kept shouting, Jeannie's going to bingo. And it used to speak different, different, different words and stuff. Uh, but that's what I remember of her as well. And where she lived as well. Always rich times. They always spoil us with like scones and 
kicks and stuff like that. We've heard a lot of your stories so far. We're bringing this episode to an end, which has been incredible. Again, leave us with this final teaser. I mean, you've been aware of Spirit for many years. Yes, and it wasn't until um, I really started to investigate it more so is then I realised that things that happened in the past wasn't my imagination. Well, on that bombshell, I think that's a great place to break in on this and close us down for now. Stephen, thank you for what you've shared today and I'm looking forward to speaking to you in the next episode. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you.